everybody, Art Ekman, along with David Bailey from Chiba Marine Stadium in Tokyo, Japan. Some 30,000 fans awaiting the action for round five of the World Supercross Series. Format just a little bit different, David, as we have an All-American final to qualify for gate positions in the main event, and then the Japanese participate in their own qualifying round for the main event. And it looks like you don't have to be an American to be in this heat <laughs> race. You got Greg Albertine, you got some guys from Australia in there. And so the American heat is underway. It's Huffman number four on the Kawasaki with Brett John second place. And that's Henry going off the track, getting a little wobbly. Doug Henry appeared to get cross right there. It swung the back end out way wide. Here's another look. See the left your screen. And it kicks back the other way, but he's still under control. And it looked like to me he just grabbed a little too much throttle and couldn't make the corner right there. Emig in third place, number two in that replay, stays there as we see number four, Damon Huffman, who's been very fast in the offseason. Got a lot of pressure right now. The two Damons out front, Damon Bradshaw, back on the 96 Honda, it looks like to me. I don't know if that was a logistics thing or if he just feels more comfortable on the machine, but looking pretty sharp right now. Sharp's not quite the words. He goes to the outside, takes the lead early. Damon Bradshaw in first place. Damon Huffman not letting him get off the hook too far now. Now, even though these two guys have been battling and the pace is quick, Albertine is right there. So if either one of these guys makes a mistake, we'll see how close he is. Pretty impressed with Bradshaw. He went around the outside of Huffman. Looked like Huffman had the best line, and Bradshaw just rode right around him. Damon Bradshaw leading at Fukuoka when he ran into problems. So we all know he's got the speed back. Maybe he just should move to Japan. Kind of like a Larry Ward Paris thing going on here. Bradshaw's knee injury in Fukuoka took him out of the Paris round in this season. Sat out with the injured knee, but has come back strong here. That's for sure. You can see all the ruts starting to develop in the face of the jumps. The soil here is really soft, like riding on a sponge. Soaks up all the horsepower. That's going to get tough pick lines in the main event. It's 18 laps. One of the big reasons why everyone from this so-called American final will qualify for the main event is the lack of riders. We've had several injuries. Let's take a look at some of them. Jeremy McGrath and Steve Lampson were injured actually on site during their practice. And Jeremy got hit pretty good in the back. Well, I'm sure that was a little bit of a scare for Honda, especially getting pretty close to next season now starting. And if he's injured that'd be a real problem ward and lusk were injured elsewhere of course lusk was injured in paris ward broke a leg and an ankle at the honda test track in california and then there are riders like craig and button racing elsewhere those two are racing in germany this weekend it's the south african greg albertine moving past damon huffman in the second place he takes that inside rut boy that's really gouging out huffman still that's the same place he got passed for the lead Charging into that corner on the inside, but he's still getting passed on the outside. That time, Albertine was able to get back in there and take the line away before the end of the corner, but Huffman's going to have to speed up through there. He's going to continue to get passed. Before entering the roof section, you see the top of your screen there, number three, Tortelli, the opportunistic youngster from France who has looked very fast but has had a hard time staying upright. He moves into third place, so it's Bradshaw. Albertine, Tortelli number three, and then Huffman number four. Bradshaw's looking pretty good right here. He seems really relaxed. You can never relax too much when you got Albertine behind you. Interesting situation here in the offseason, though, for Bradshaw. He does not yet have a complete ride for the 97 season. It's obvious that he wants to ride the 97 season because he's showcasing himself right here. Well, it's a pretty tough trip to go to Japan, especially twice. Uh, it's a long flight, takes a lot out of you, and it's just one quick race. 18 laps, not even a 20-lap final. But uh, he's definitely proven himself here, and if he does well, it's definitely going to help his chance of picking up a pretty solid ride for 97. David, it looks like he spent a lot of time in the saddle. He looks very comfortable out there, and no one's really gaining on him, but he's unable to pull away at the moment as well. It's Damon Bradshaw leading our qualifying round. We'll be back to Tokyo in a moment. Welcome back to round five of the World Supercross Series. This one coming to you from Tokyo, Japan. We're in the qualifying round now for 
All the Americans, Europeans, and Aussies. As Damon Bradshaw is our leader, this is actually just a battle for gate positions, as all 10 of these riders will qualify for the main event. You see in the background a tremendous crowd on hand at this beautiful stadium in Tokyo, Japan. Some 30,000 people. Damon Bradshaw shaking his head a little bit. May have hit his head on the crossbar. Oh. Yeah, he took a pretty good impact partway through there. Damon's one of the only riders I've ever seen do that. He shakes his head a lot. I, th I think he may have seen Larry Ward do it too, but uh, sometimes you get a rock or a little pebble inside of your goggles. And I don't know how it ever gets there, but sometimes it finds its way in there and you just try to shake it around, keep it from getting in your eye. What a bad break for Larry Ward. This is his season. He's always done well in the World Supercross season. He won a, a victory, of course, in the first race in Paris this year. He took a second in Fukuoka, and then a third and second Paris race. Uh, gosh, what a bad break. Well, the, the timing in his career to have an injury uh, that severe to the femur and also to the foot, it's going to take him a while to heal. It's going to miss part of the 97 season. and. Uh, boy, it's going to be really tough for him to come back strong from that. And really, what can he hope to gain in 97? Pretty much just take him out of the title. I think, too, David, it just points to the fact that it's just as dangerous in practice as it is right here in competition. Well, in practice, a lot of times, that's the thing people don't realize. They see Jeremy doing a knack-knack during the parade lap and during the Supercross season, and they're thinking, boy, you better be careful. Well, if you could see what that guy did all week, I think that that's really where you need to be careful. That's where you have to push it and take those chances so you can come out here and perform. And uh, it's surprising to me that these guys are able to stay healthy for the kind of season that has uh, really begun to develop with all these off-season races. We just saw Sebastian Tortelli move into second place in front of Albertine as Bradshaw now has uh, pulled a little bit of an extra breath between first and second place. Damon Huffman just went backwards and leads me to believe that uh, the setup is wrong or he's just not agreeing with the ruts. And also, you always have to take into consideration it could be arm pump. Anytime you see a guy that's capable of running out front fade like that, uh, arm pump is usually the culprit. Tortelli, a very young rider from France, and of course, when we were in Paris for the three rounds there, uh, was uh, so encouraged by the French fans. And he's got a lot of future in this game. He certainly has improved over one year of action. I think this is great for him to ride in more of these Supercross-type races against the Americans to get that, that confidence and that experience of riding against a lot of different riders and the technique that it takes to ride a Supercross track. Look at the timing through here. The ruts, you see how the teeth are starting to get, the soil sticky, and to be able to ride in all these conditions, you see right here he's gaining on Bradshaw. Uh, this is what makes a rider very versatile. Boy, some of these corners, you can really see the, the compression that those forks have to have to perform. You also think about when you sit down on the seat and put your leg out for the corner, you gotta put your leg out a lot higher because the bike's sinking down into that rut, you tend to catch your foot in, the, in that sticky soil. Back to Tortelli, he hopes to come to the United States to uh, have at least one, maybe two races in the Supercross season in 125 action before returning to Europe. Of course, he won the 125 GP World Championship last year, winning nine of the 11 events. Very popular on the motocross scene there in Europe. Maybe one of these days taking on Stefan Everts for that 250 crown. That won't be easy. Talk to Stefan. And he has plans of winning more titles than anybody. First, he wants to equal the record of his father, Harry Everts, and then he wants to be the all-time leader in world championships, and he's young enough to do it. Boy, in that uh, series, too, you don't win championships without uh, taking physical abuse as well. Well, but, whoa, Bradshaw got his foot. That's what I was talking about. He got his foot kind of taken off the peg, grabbed a handful of throttle, and a little out of control there for a moment, but he pulled it off nice. Boy, anything can happen when these ruts get difficult, like in that last turn. He actually jumped ruts. Well, you can see that one they just came through there right after the finish line. There was no berm there when the race started. So that's how deep that's gotten uh, just in the laps they've run so far. So you can imagine in the main event, when they go 18 laps, these are all going to get a lot deeper. Boy, it's good to see Bradshaw back in competitive form like this. Coming out of retirement, it was trying to catch up with all the rest of the field that had a year and a half on him while he was out of action. Well, that's, that's difficult. I think so. You, you have a lot of things to warm back up to. The guys ride a little bit differently. And, and talking with some of the guys after I stopped riding and, uh, of how the sport changed, where technique was important, but 
it's more just kind of hang it out type style that was getting the job done. And adjusting to that is difficult. Damon, uh, he can do both, but I think he was a lot more, uh, a lot better at being able to think things through and ride a little bit more technical. Sebastian Tortelli losing space in second place. It's Bradshaw in the lead with Tortelli in second. Bradshaw's lines are starting to come together nice. He's starting to square some of these corners and get off over to the edge of the racetrack. You can see right there in the loop section. And since he's been on a Honda, he's led a lot of laps, I can tell you that. Greg Albertine is still in third place as you see Bradshaw passing Mike Brown. That's the first appearance this year we've seen of Mike Brown. He's had some races in the United States, but coming back from a slight injury. We'll be back with more action from Tokyo, Japan in a moment. It's Damon Bradshaw, number 10, out in front of our first qualifying round from Tokyo, Japan. Round five of the World Supercross Series. Art Ekman, David Bailey bringing the play-by-play -play to you. Damon's looked flawless so far. He's had a couple of bumps on the chin, and that's about it. Yeah, one little uh, miscue through the whoop section, and that's been about it. He's been, looks like he's been searching around, trying to pick good lines, been relaxed over the jump. He really made any major mistakes, and uh, he had to earn the lead, too. He had to get around Huffman. Since he's done that, he's been smooth ever since. Well, a good performance and at a good location to open some eyes for a possible ride for next year. Next season, I should say, 1997, coming up pretty quick. David Bradshaw just dominating since he took over the lead from Damon Huffman early in the race. Huffman went backwards, and Tortelli came a scooting. There's Damon Bradshaw. Showing his approval of the checkered flag. Portelli taking second place. Greg Albertine, the South African, in third. So we had a Frenchman and a South African taking second and third in an All-American qualifying round, as they title it here. In Bradshaw, obviously happy. Wheeling around for the fan. Good to see him in a good mood. Bradshaw, our winner. Emig and Hughes in the running for the points title in fourth and fifth. Earlier, the all-Japanese qualifying round took place. Let's take a look at some of the highlights now. Takaturo Atsudo will get the whole shot, number 50, on the Honda. On the outside, it was Kuei Kiga, but he can't make a move. He got sealed out of there, number 32. Number 20, Sasaki takes over the lead in the jumps. David, with the skill levels of the Japanese riders, uh, this is a good format, really, to have race together for the Japanese fans. Well, I think it makes more sense for the for the fans to have all the Japanese race against each other, and then the best guy can really have a chance to shine, then put all the Americans together, which is the way it usually is, to give the Japanese people a chance to see how that looks, and then put them all together in the main event. I think it's very exciting. Whoa, Sasaki got a little bit of rebound there. And here comes Narita, number 33, number 50. Atsudo was already into that mix. A three-way battle up front now, but holding on is Suzaki here in our highlights from the all-Japanese qualifying round. Moving to further action in the same qualifying heat. Watch Narita, number 33, on the outside. Look out, a kamikaze move. Akira Narita took over the lead. This guy is not afraid to gas it, that's for sure, but <laughs> he looks like an accident waiting to happen. He's completely out of control. And here was one of the many out-of-control situations that ended up on the turf. Atsuka uh, picking up number 18 to get back into the action. Moving ahead to further action, still in the lead. It's number 33, Akira Narita. Narita is a wild rider. Well, he's, he's going to use up all the banners before they get through the night, it looks like. <laughs> And he did a nosedive to the whoop to do section. And it's some places he looks under control, and others completely out of control. Very inconsistent as he goes through the whole lap. Sushi, another casualty in this qualifying round. And we see in our highlights Narita riding on the edge. So you just had a feeling at every moment something was going to happen to number 33. <laughs> That kind of riding takes so much strength to keep the bike upright. When you're just on the edge of control, you got to hang on tight. Meaning it's right around the edge there as well. Look at Atsudo, though, in behind. Coming up short on the jump was Narita. Atsudo follows suit, takes over the lead. This is a lead that he will not relinquish, although he has the wild man, Narita, in back of him. Uh -huh. 
They gave the Japanese fans all they could handle, the 30,000 strong, really appreciating this all Japanese duo. And the further action. Still holding out of that lead, Takaturo Atsudo. And those ruts are really digging big caverns out now. This rivalry continues in our highlights now on the final lap. Narita to the inside, taking the lead. But with his style of riding, could he hold on to it with Asudo playing the pressure? And here's what happened. Asudo to the inside. Now watch Narita jump over the rut. Out of control, checkered flag. Atsudo Atsudo, the victor. The World Supercross Series has been an exciting adventure up to this point. A different winner in every of the four previous World Supercross rounds. Let's take a look now at how we got this far. Round number one, Fukuoka, Japan. We've already seen a shot of Mike Kudrowski. Good to see him back on a bike. Number 100. And Kudrowski would do very good in his first appearance coming back, getting back into shape, placing in the top 10. But here's how it started out in the first round of the World Supercross Tour. Damon Bradshaw would move out quickly to the lead. Looked like Team Kawasaki had the whole shot going in the first corner. Everybody went wide. Bradshaw in that new 97 Honda snuck around the inside, came out the lead. What an encouraging scene it was for Bradshaw for a while anyway. Look at the team of Kawasaki's behind number 10. Number four is Damon Huffman. As we move to further action, Huffman puts the pressure on Bradshaw with Emig right behind him, the reward number six. Into the woods. And Huffman is looking for opportunity. He'll be knocking on his door shortly. He kept the pressure on, as did Emig and Larry Ward back there in their own battle. Just like in the heat race, Larry Ward coming on strong from a poor start. Every one of these riders wanting to get off to a good start in this series because they want to chase the title if they've got a shot for it. It's important to them. Huffman then, a little bang bang, Bradshaw looks back to say, hey, who are you? And then tries to survive a Kawasaki sandwich through this area. Watch how tight it gets in this corner. They go around both sides of it, but Damon, smarter of the three, squares it off and comes out in the lead again. You can see right there, he started looking around. That was a bad sign. And a further action, we've got Larry Ward in the scene, hounding Bradshaw, and it's Ward number six out of the woods. Ward looking very strong in this first race. On the Honda Troy machine. Watch him blast out of the corner. A little wheelie and some breathing room for Larry Ward. An impressive performance as we move to further action now. He gets pressure from Jeff Emmy. Emmy jumping inside to take over the lead for Larry Ward. Both these riders winning their heat races earlier. Definitely the fastest guys on the racetrack. We're in the battle amongst themselves, but Emmick seemed to be a little stronger towards the end. We did not see it from the Japanese coverage, but Bradshaw went down, injuring a knee. In fact, this was one of only a couple of times that he kissed the deck. It was Emig, though, taking the checkered flag, winning the first round of the World Supercross Tour. Ward second, Huffman third, an impressive fourth for Ezra Lusk on his first ride on a Yamaha. We'll be back to check out the world's greatest Supercross show, as they title it, from Gay Perry. The highlights coming up next. Back with more highlights of our World Supercross Series in round two, Paris, France. Well, David, it's always known as a great show. Lasers, uh, all kinds of rock band music, and uh, great entertainment, not just a good race. Oh, well, the way they bring the riders out, too, and you can see right there next to Jeremy, Skip Norfolk, unable to make it because of a little uh, mishap with the passport. So his friend Lou being his mechanic for the first night. It's a little different scenario for McGrath. He's used to having uh, everything go his way and be pampered. Do not turn away from these highlights because this was a tremendously exciting first round in Paris for the second round of the Supercross series. With only 16 riders at the gate, positioning really wasn't that important. Ryan Hughes came out of the last chance qualifier to get the whole shot. A great move from the outside, however. And the more amazing thing than that was most of the time when guys got the whole shot drifted wide, they had four or five guys tuck underneath it, but Ryan pegged it around the berm and stayed in the lead. 
This action was so tight at Bercy in Paris that one little mistake meant a lot of change. The vicious whoops, we jump ahead in the action. It was that close that Ryan Hughes would bobble and then new leaders making the freight train. Dropping all the way back to fourth place. Now he has pressure from Jeremy McGrath, number one, who also had a bad start. Albertine wrestled that lead away from Hughes, but here's how Ward does it with finesse. He's got good position on Albertine and keeps the pressure on all the time. As we move ahead now, Larry Ward, number six, trying to make the move in the whoops. Albertine gives him the room, and Larry Ward took over the lead. Pace got quicker and quicker through the whoop section. Tortelli, a little out of control that particular lap. It'll get worse for Tortelli through the whoop section as it does for a lot of riders. And of course, the closer Tortelli got to the leaders, the more rabid the rabid French fans became at Bercy. And that's where air horns are legal in the stands. One of the neat features about Paris is the fact they go into the tunnel, and as they did, Larry Ward hits a kicker. High side, stays on the track though, but he loses the lead to Albertine. You can see that Ryan Hughes and McGrath are starting to close in. Moving to further action. Albertine the leader, Ward in second. Watch number three, Tortelli, the Frenchman, get out of sorts. And Emig has to slow down. McGrath picking up even tighter on Emig at that point. But watch these two. Here's where the battle is. And what a tremendous fight to the end it became. This is not only the last lap, but this will be the final turn, and Albertine loses it. An absolute inopportune moment goes flying off the track, handing the crown to Larry Ward. Hughes in second, Tortelli third, Huffman and Emig the top five, Albertine in seventh, and the defending champion McGrath in his first world supercross race ended up in 10. Now we mentioned before the great show they put on here in Barcy, and this was only part of it. It's always pretty wild. I remember when the first time I went over there, I had to break through a banner in order to get out of the, into the stadium for the main event. And I was more worried about that than I was about the race. Greg Albertine enjoying the opening ceremonies. There's Ezra Lusk and John Dowd. And the chauffeur, the number one rider, Jeremy McGrath. This was his first appearance, Paris, on the World uh, Supercross Tour. And uh, he got about $100,000 for three nights appearances there. That's what we hear. Perhaps that could be a uh, reason why he finished 10th. He's not taking any chances. He's already rich. <laughs> Skip Norfolk was back, though, for this second evening of racing. His mechanic finding his passport. And Jeremy McGrath looked like a different rider here at the beginning of the uh, race. Taking the whole shot was Michael Craig. And McGrath was right on his tail with Damon Huffman in third at the start. Tortelli in fourth. Number 15, Michael Craig looking fast as always through the whoops, but Jeremy McGrath right there. Another uncharacteristically bad start for number two, Jeff Emig. Having to work his way through the pack again, but McGrath kept the pressure on. Emig winning the first round and taking fifth in the first race here in Paris. Trying to stay consistent. He wants this title, put it in his bio. Jeremy McGrath was the current leader, though, as we move ahead. Michael Craig in second has some problems there with fish tailing in the whoops. Huffman makes the pass. Here's the battle between Tortelli and Emig. Emig winning that one. And Emig then would take on Michael Craig next. Jeremy McGrath then started getting pressure. Here's the battle for the lead. Damon Huffman, a nice clean outside move. Jeremy McGrath really hadn't worked out since the motocross to nations. This is the first time really he's been on this particular bike. So he had a lot of things to sort out. Emick right there taking a look up the inside. Just keep the pressure on McGrath. He never had a chance to relax. And right there, a little bobble was all it took for Emick to make the move. Tough place for Jeremy to return to action in Paris. The racing, as you can already see, is so tight. Larry Ward, number six, the next one to make an assault on Jeremy as Jeremy will sink back to take a fifth position here in the second race in Paris. Here's the final lap at Bercy. Fans can almost reach out and touch you on those whoop sections. 
Damon Huffman, who won his first international supercross last year with Geneva, winning his first one of this season. So we've had different riders winning so far. Emig, the first round at Fukuoka. Then Larry Ward here in Paris. Huffman in Paris. We'd see another winner here in the third and final race in Paris. Jimmy Button at the start line. A last second call got him to Paris with Bradshaw's injury, unable to report. And those on new machines for the first time. As Roleski see there, Pichon number seven, the first time he's on a Suzuki. As Roles getting more practice time on his new Yamaha in this race. There's Greg Albertine. He's hoping he doesn't throw another one away like he did for Larry Ward in the first Paris race. He's game though. He keeps coming back for more. Here was the start. McGrath, the good inside line. It looks like he has a whole shot, but once again, Ryan Hughes takes the outside line. He had to, getting a poor gate position in the first race, but this time he didn't have to, and he got the whole shot. Ryan Hughes, number nine, as we move to further action, got the pressing action from Jeremy McGrath, and coming out of the tunnel, it was Jeremy McGrath taking over the lead. This is when Jeremy McGrath just seemed to put it all together. He had his mechanic, Skip Norfolk, back with him. A little bit more dialed in on this new machine, a 97 Honda. You can see from these shots how far ahead they were a third. Albertine meeting Bethes, the French rider, number 25. Number three is Tortelli. And Bethes this time looks back and says, take your pick. So Greg Albertine moving up the ladder, as is uh, Sebastian Tortelli, number three. Jeremy McGrath on way to his first World Supercross victory of the season, pointing to the fans. He took two out of three here in Perry last year, the checkered flag this year. So that's how we got to Tokyo, Japan, and round number five. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Tokyo, Japan for round five of the World Supercross Series. Getting ready and set at the gate now for the main event. You see Damon Bradshaw, the leading qualifier of all the Americans, as it's a very orderly start here in Japan. Well, the fastest qualifier out of the first heat will get his first pick of the line. That's Bradshaw. You see everybody back there waiting. Albertine, Ryan Hughes, their number nine. Got some umbrellas. I don't know if it's starting to sprinkle here or not, but uh, I, I know it's not to keep the sun out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite an array of umbrellas in the background there. But th how does that affect the soil here in Japan? Well, it's pretty tacky, so it's, it's not going to get real slippery. Uh, what it will do is make it worse for vision. That stuff's going to stick to the lenses and make it a little bit more difficult there. The only way it would really change anything is if it was a downpour or it kept raining a little harder at, through the main event. David, when you were on the starting line here in Tokyo, how did you visualize things? Actually, all my visualization was done back in the pits at a, kind of a quiet time. By the time you get to the starting line, if you're still trying to visualize, you're too late because there's, there's no way to, to try to be calm on the starting. Look at all the fidgeting. I mean, none of these guys can hold still anymore. It's, you're just anxious to uh, have that gate drop, and once it does, you're completely relaxed. Compared to Paris, this is a mammoth gate with 21 riders revving it up, getting ready to go. You know, in the, when I was here, the way the Japanese used to rev the bike, Art, was just so irritating for the American riders. Just, nah, nah, they would never let the bike rest. <laughs> okay, we're set now. to go. Will we have another new winner on the World Supercross Tour? Emig a good start. And Sudo at a good start, but it's Bradshaw on the inside. He gets the whole shot. Albertine with a good inside move on Dowd. You see Albertine, number eight, Dowd, number 14. So it is Bradshaw, number 10. Albertine, number eight, Dowd, 14. And then Tortelli has moved up from mid-pack to look like he wants to become a contender. Also, number two, just going by there, Amig and Ryan Hughes, just a few riders further back. Oh, Takakazu and Chiba get tangled up there, two of the Japanese riders. Well, the battle lines are truly formed with Bradshaw and Albertine. You can see that they've done a little bit of work to the racetrack. They've kind of knocked down some of those deep ruts before the main event, so uh, this is going to be pretty much, you can take any line you want there for a while, but after about four or five laps, it's going to be deep ruts in all the corners, especially in the faces of all the jumps. Albertine trying to show a wheel once again to Bradshaw, saying, hey, I'm right here. I don't think Bradshaw is going to have any part of it. 
I'm pretty impressed with the way he looked in his heat race, too. He just looks forward, going fast, not worrying about what's going on behind him. And once again, with a great opportunity, the same thing. He's got a good, aggressive confidence, David. Well, it's the best I've seen him look in a long time, and it's been a long time since I've seen him out in the lead, so that's probably got something to do with his attitude. I'll be hanging close, though, the South African. Very disappointed, of course, in Paris after leading most of the entire race and then on the last turn going off the track and Larry Ward just sailed to the championship in that particular round. And Albertine uh, certainly has done a good job at proving that the 250 Suzuki program under Roger DeCoster is on the move. Ooh, Bradshaw. Little mistake there. I was just about to say, Bradshaw hasn't made any mistakes. His timing has been fantastic. So right there. And Albertine tried to take advantage of it. He's giving a message to uh, Bradshaw. Bradshaw trying to hold on. Oh, good move by Bradshaw. Looked almost as though he made a corner up in the air. Looked like Albertine had to look up the inside, and Bradshaw, as soon as he landed, closed off that line. Boy, Albie making a move, showing a tire, sending the message. And Bradshaw, as you said, just wasn't affected by it. It's a pretty wide open racetrack, too. Look how wide the finish line jump is. You see that berm right there starting to develop. Looks like there's plenty of places to pass, and it's going to get even better as a, the main line starts to get really rough to be able to search around. And uh, the lappers will really play a major role, too, later in the race. Anytime you got ruts, you're always going to have good passing. And whoop sections have become treacherous after a while. That'll just serve some lappers in front of you. You gotta watch watch out for your lines. Bradshaw again shaking his head off the triple. I don't know what he's <laughs> doing, but that's a trademark. I don't see anybody else doing it. As we take a look at our leaders, Bradshaw and Albertine, uh, our Tokyo camera crew has not really given us a shot yet of John Dowd and Emig battling for third. Welcome back to Tokyo, Japan, round five of the World Supercross Series. Our leader here in the main event is Damon Bradshaw. He had a dominating move in the qualifying round and held on all the way. This time, he's got Greg Albertine on his fender. Still looking pretty good, maintaining a, just enough breathing room where he can take the line he wants without the fear of Albertine coming in there and running over his foot. If Albertine's close enough, he'll do that. Both riders very aggressive. In front of 30,000 people you can see in the stands here in Tokyo, Japan. A little different texture of crowd in Tokyo than you see in Paris. Well, Paris, they don't. <laughs> you, know, you, you hear them when you're riding with a helmet on. You can hear everything. But uh, here they just appreciate it. They sit there quietly and just, they're entertained. They don't look like they're very entertained, but they are. Hughes and Tortelli. Hughes number nine, Tortelli number three, and they're battling for fifth position right now. Hughes never likes to give up a position without a counterattack. Look at the lead Tortelli already pulled just in one corner. He's already opened up about 25, 30 yards on Hughes. It's pretty surprising to see that Emig had such a good start, but still don't see him yet. On the edge of our shots, we see Dowd still in third place as Bradshaw and Albertine, one and two. What a victory this would be to boost Damon Bradshaw's confidence as well as his visibility going into the 1997 season. Another yellow flag, and Katahira is trying to restart after going down. But Damon Bradshaw, back to Damon. He won nine Supercross races in AMA action in 1992, only to lose the title in the last race in Los Angeles at the Coliseum. He came back strong at the beginning of 93. And uh, third place uh, in Orlando, Houston, and Texas, he won. But his last Supercross victory, his last one, was that year, 1993, in Atlanta, Georgia, in February. Hasn't won one since. Of course, he had the year and a half retirement in between. Albertine really picking up the pace now. These guys are starting to pull tearaways as they get through these lappers. Vision will be a problem. That's Ooh. something we can't see. Here comes Albertine. Nice positioning that time by Bradshaw. He's making sure he's got the best line right here on the inside. If he was to drift out in that outside line going in, you can bet Albertine would sneak in there and take it away. Albertine now has the inside, but uh, Bradshaw hangs on. Oh, what a battle. 
That should let Damon know what Albertine's intentions are. Albertine gets by Damon Bradshaw. Can Damon come back? No, Greg Albertine has taken over the lead here. Bradshaw takes it right back again with a good block pass. Albertine forced to the edge of the track. Well, that is the Damon Bradshaw that I remember seeing win nine races. Albertine up the inside. This has a little bit more speed, takes away the inside line, but then Bradshaw right back. Albertine had to lift his foot out of the way, actually ran through some of the banners there. Bradshaw didn't appreciate that bump after the finish line and tapped him right back. Well, both riders showing great aggressive style. Well, now it's back to the drawing board for Albertine. So you can bet that Bradshaw's going to remember that spot. He'll make sure that he covers that line the next time around if Albertine's close enough. Sneaking into our shot from time to time as Emig has moved up and is in third place. Tortelli fourth outside our picture, supplied by our Japanese network. Good looking shot of Bradshaw coming out of that berm, wheeling it out of it. Perfect balance. As soon as you get into those berms, you drag the fork legs, you start dragging foot pegs and frame rails, and if you can wheelie the bike a little bit as you come out of the corner, nothing drags. It's all horsepower. There you see Emig in third spot. Tortelli in fourth, and Dowd is still in the top five. Right now, Bradshaw trying to hold on to the top position now. He's run a tremendous race. He's got to feel great for him. I bet he'd like to see the white flag right now. <laughs> I know that's what it, when you can see guys catching up as Emig looks like he's starting to do. Well, you just want to see the white flag get it over with, especially when it's yours to lose. A tough place to be. Look at the ruts they're having to deal with right now. This particular soil ruts up quickly. He's dragging his foot pegs in the face of that finish line jump. It's going to get worse. Bradshaw searching for a new line, and he almost picks up some banners that time. Bradshaw, Albertine, and Emig, our top three. We'll be back to Tokyo in a moment. Welcome back to our main event from Tokyo, Japan. And it's Damon Bradshaw, still our leader. But number eight, Greg Albertine, the South African on a new Suzuki, is right behind him. Look at those ruts as they just dig deeper and deeper. That keeps you thinking, that's for sure. Well, it takes more balance. Look at that. Another another great shot of Damon wheeling out of that berm. The horsepower, though, if you don't grip with your outside leg, a bike just squirts out from underneath you. He ended up kind of onto the back of the seat, but pulled it off well. The, the ruts and this sticky soil will bring out the worst in any rider. I remember watching practice uh, on tracks like this. you seeing the... And my competitors look pretty bad, thinking, well, you know, I think I'm going to have it tonight. And then I get out there and realize how hard it is to ride. And a hero was one of the lappers that Bradshaw went by. And this is going to be an increasing problem as they catch up with more of the slower riders. Because of the lines being so definitive uh, with the ruts, it's going to cause some problems, I have a feeling, coming up right now. Well, that's a situation like that, you almost rather be in second. I mean, it's, it's nice to be in the lead, but... Boy, you don't know which way to go. All depends on who's in front of you, right? <laughs> well, if you got lappers occupying the best lines and you got Albertine and Emmett breathing down your neck, you know, what are you yeah. going to do? Take the inside and uh, have them go around you? Yeah, hopefully it's a lapper that doesn't know any better. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a tight spot. That's why you just want to have as big a lead as you can possibly have. Tanaka is the next uh, lapper that Bradshaw is trying to get around there. Bradshaw... And Emig is not that far back in third, as you see Albertine number eight and Emig number two. Well, just as Bradshaw starts to pull away a little bit from Albertine, Emig starts applying the pressure. Oh, Emig goes in a little tight, kind of stalls it out a little bit before continuing. Yeah, that's going to give Albertine another little bit of breathing room, but it looked like Emig was starting to close the gap, push Albertine. That's going to push both these guys up to Damon, and we're looking for an exciting finish. See Damon timing still looking good. He keeps squaring this corner tighter and tighter every lap. All the way on the edge of the racetrack right there, able to get all the, over all those jumps clean. Especially if you have lappers like he's got right now in the middle of the course. Bradshaw zipping by our cameras. A lot of times those lappers are don't have quite the confidence of the leaders coming around to run all the way against the edge of the racetrack like that. Because if you make any mistake at all, you're off. Tanaka restarting again. 
as Bradshaw battling it out with the, another lapper. Gives him an elbow. That's what you have to do. This is his race. Molokai got his elbow. He can go home and say to his kids, hey, I just got elbowed by Damon Bradshaw. <laughs> Providing Damon wins. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And anything could happen, really, on this kind of a track with uh, this much pressure from guys like Albertine and Emmy. So far, Bradshaw's looking very strong and well-conditioned. Really surprised at how fast this track is deteriorating. Starting to see a lot more mistakes by everyone. Tortelli in fifth, leaving his mark on a couple of lappers there as he's riding on the edge trying to catch up. Uh, he's giving it all he's got to that whoop section. A little out of shape. Uh-oh, off the racetrack. He's going to have to turn back around. He'll drop a few spots. He's cutting the ribbon of a new track, maybe, or something. <laughs> I don't know. Tortelli, number three. Lots of promise in the future. He's, he's very young. But the experience he's gained and, of course, the championship, the confidence from the 125 World Grand Prix uh, of last year is certainly uh, he'll build on that. He does want to race in the United States. He's coming over for a couple of races uh, this next mm -hmm. season before the uh, World Grand Prix starts uh, in the 97 year. Bradshaw is our leader, number 10. Still looking good, but he's unable to put away Albertine. Albertine's been able to pick up things. Yeah, they make a little time here, lose a little time there. The lappers, I think, are really determining how this lead uh, looks from time to time. We were mentioned it hasn't been since uh, 1993 that Bradshaw's won a Supercross race, and of course a year and a half in retirement during that period of time as well. But Albertine has never won a Supercross. Well, he's keeping the pressure on and doing what you, what I would expect anybody to do in his position. I mean, on a track like this, you can see how deep the rut's getting. Damon having a lot of trouble right there trying to protect that inside. So a three-time world motocross champion tries to keep up with Bradshaw. We'll see who wins out. Time running out for the field with Damon Bradshaw in the lead here in Tokyo, Japan. The banners are missing through that whoop section. It leads me to believe that plenty of people have gone off the racetrack there and taken them with them. See Damon right there as he's in the air. He's looking up the racetrack a little way just to kind of get in his head how many lappers he's going to have to contend with before the checkered flag. Albertine. Fairly close. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of strategy he plans. He's tried very aggressively now twice to make a pass on Bradshaw. It was successful one time, but Damon came back on him to reestablish the lead. Well, the problem right now is that I mean, for Albertine at least, is that he has dropped off the pace some. Albertine needs to be a lot closer to Damon to apply any pressure to force him into a mistake. A little one right there, though. That'll help for Greg. Well, it looks like Greg is picking up seconds in the corners, too. Uh, two mistakes in a row by Damon coming at a bad time. That's allowed Greg to get close, and you can hear the crowd. We're in the final lap. Here comes... Albertine with good speed. Bradshaw cannot afford a mistake now. Oh, Albertine cuts in front. Bradshaw's down. Albertine in the final corner has won this race. Well, we were just talking about strategy. A good block. And Albertine really had to stop to make the turn. Well, he got just close enough. Here's another look. I'd have done the same thing. Got just close enough. Damon maybe should have seen that coming. I don't think he realized Albertine was that close. Otherwise, he may have glanced over his shoulder and put on the brakes a little bit well, the and then tried to cut, cut underneath, yes. you know, just underneath him. But uh, it sure didn't work out for the better for Damon. Damon, though, presence of mind to get up and cross the line in second place. So, whoa, Damon Bradshaw is not too happy about uh, a racing move by Albertine. Well, you got to understand he'd be pretty upset right there, but uh, looking at it from this side of the fence, I think if I were Albertine, I would have gone in and done the same thing. And for Damon, I think, you know, he was probably a little bit surprised. Uh, and to lead that thing all the way like that, sure, he'd be, I'd be dis disappointed as well. Ian Harrison is tried and true mechanic who stuck with him through the good and the bad as we take another look at Damon Bradshaw very frustrated and uh, still it's a good thing he's not playing out his emotions our third place uh, finisher and uh, still points leader 
is Jeff Hemming. There's Roger DeCoster coming in. You think he's happy getting a win right there in Tokyo, Japan? He looks happier than Greg right now. <laughs> he probably has every reason to be if the Suzuki uh, execs are, are in the stands. I'm sure they are. So a great win for Greg Albertine, and that means we have still have a different winner every race in this World Supercross Series. It's got to be a tough pill for Damon Bradshaw to swallow after such an outstanding performance throughout most of the entire race. Albertine, Bradshaw, Emig, Dowd, and Tortelli are top five here in Tokyo, Japan. Doug Henry's first race in the World Supercross Series, placing seventh. You know, for Damon, it had to feel just like a cheap shot. Uh, but after he looks at the video, he'll probably realize, well, if I was Greg, I may have come in and done the same thing. That's what it's all about. It's that moment where you got to make a decision. If you want to win, that's what it's going to take. Jeff Hemming remains atop. The points as we go now to Geneva for the final two rounds. Emig will go there with a nine-point lead over Damon Huffman and Ryan Hughes. It's going to be a battle of Kawasaki's for the world championship. As we take a look at some of the very aggressive moves on the track that were really needed in this type of tight racing here in Tokyo. David, I was a little bit surprised. I didn't expect such tight racing, and maybe I didn't anticipate the lappers uh, creating such roadblocks in different areas. Speaking of roadblocks, check out this one for Tortelli, number three. Keeps it up on two wheels, but taking another look at the pass to the lead, Albertine up the inside. Bradshaw probably wishes he could do that over. I don't think he realized uh, that Albertine was so close. And I think it was a breakthrough race for both of these riders. Damon, I think, opened a few eyes. Knows he's only got to go about 100 feet farther without a mistake to win a Supercross again. He's back on winning form. And Albertine, his first ever Supercross. See if he can do it in the States next year. Well, it's going to be a big confidence boost, though, for, as you mentioned, both riders as we get set for the 97 season back in America. A different winner in every race so far in the World Supercross Series as we move on to Geneva.